Bay Buccaneers were the laughingstock of the NFL. In the 80s and 90s, they endured an NFL record 14 straight losing seasons. Warren Sapp, who grew up in Orlando, had a front row seat for the Bucks' futility. They always beamed the Buck game to Orlando, and it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare to watch that ugly team play in those ugly uniforms in that big high school stadium. Wake up! You're looking at me like I'm not even talking. You're not hearing me. Tampa Bay Buccaneers weren't known for anything except losing. They were Bush League, an organizational black hole where careers went to die. As fate would have it, that's exactly where Warren Sapp ended up in the 1995 draft. I gotta relive that nightmare. Thanks. <laughs> Not a good time right now. Due to allegations of a positive drug test, the standout defensive tackle from the University of Miami dropped all the way to the Bucks at number 12. The yucks. I mean, the worst day of my life. Now I was a part of this. They get to stay in the state of Florida. This is a Florida guy. Yeah. So it's Warren, good consolation. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is this yeah. a situation where one of these days you're going to look back and say, hey, I told you so? I mean, I'm just, I'm just happy that, you know, Bucks made this decision and, you know, I'm just ready to move on and play some ball right now. With their second first round pick, Tampa gambled again, drafting undersized linebacker Derek Brooks. The Bucks had hit the jackpot and Warren Sapp knew it. He and Brooks had crossed paths before. I'm 18 years old, leaving high school in a Florida Georgia All-Star game. The player of the year, defensive player of the year is Derek Brooks. So I'm a tight end. We get to go up against each other. So he lines up and I put the move on him. I left him at the line of playing tight end, caught the ball and this guy came screaming across my face. I dropped the ball, I said, holy. I mean, the fastest football player I've ever been around in my life. And he was just 17 and I was 18 at the time, just leaving high school. I had no idea that four years later, we'd be on the same team trying to build the worst NFL team into a champion. <laughs> Tampa, Sapp, and Brooks joined safety John Lynch, number 47, and together they became the cornerstones of the franchise. Lynch had been there since 1993 and had already earned a reputation. And he walks up to me and he says, I'm John Lynch. And I looked at him, I said, yeah, you're that hitting white boy that plays safety. <laughs> That's the first encounter of me and Lynch had. He is a monster. That's, that's what he was, a hard-hitting white boy that played safety, and he was something special. Despite his reputation, Lynch still had to prove himself to Sapp, who scoffed at his affluent background. We kind of had our run-ins for a while. You know, I was raised out in San Diego. My dad had uh, had made a success of himself financially. Oh, I mean, Lynch, I, I just want to know, is your dad a senator? See, you're a son of a senator, you ain't been, you ain't been, you know, you know adverse situation. That, he kind of used to joke around that I was raised with a silver spoon in my mouth. If you make it past 24 with a silver spoon in your mouth, because most of y'all kill yourself, you know that. I got too much, I only, only got two BMWs, a red one and a black one, I want a blue one. You, know? you couldn't have thin skin around Warren Sapp because he was going to bust you on everything and anything. No, that's backwards, you dumbass. Which are you facing? You about as dumb as a box of rocks. He was always going. Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da. <laughs> With a strong foundation in place, Tony Dungy was hired in 1996 to take the Buccaneers to the next level. A year later, pewter power was born. The Bucks was nothing before Tony got there. He built the pyramid right in front of us and said, this is how we're going to do it. We got to practice doing things right all the time, little things, huh? details. We realized that if everybody has their gaps and everybody's responsible for what they need to be responsible for, we can win. We can win. In Dungy's six years in Tampa Bay, the Bucks sent multiple defenders to the Pro Bowl and made the playoffs four times. But they never reached the Super Bowl. And they could never beat Philadelphia. The Eagles knocked the Bucks out of the playoffs in 2000 and 2001. Both times, the offense failed to score a touchdown. For a lot of guys on our team, those first two years of traveling to Philly, really scared to get out. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, scared to get out. I mean, we used to get in that game, and it'd be cold, and Philly be flying around, hitting people on defense. 
they used to just handle us. I mean, that was a very frustrating thing for a guy like me because I knew they wasn't a better football team. It was just at times, we were just afraid. Ultimately, the head coach was held responsible. Tony Dungy was fired after the 2001 season. I think I can say this because he's in the position that he's in. He just let the offense lax too much. He really did. It always felt like the offense wasn't held to the same standards that we were held to, and there started to be some tension. And you go time after time after time to the playoffs. It's time you do something. He just had a too lax attitude for that ball club, for that time, for us. But I love him to death. Bucks owner Malcolm Glazer knew he needed a coach with star power to replace the highly respected Tony Dungy. So he set his sights on Oakland head coach John Gruden, who had led the Raiders to two straight division titles. I buy something here! Get something going! Get after their ass! Gruden's intensity earned him the nickname Chucky because of his likeness to the killer doll from the horror movie Child's Play. He certainly fit the bill as a high-profile coach. In 2001, Gruden was named one of People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People. Well, I was looking pretty good those days, you know. I had this California hairstyle, I guess, you know. I got a reputation to try and live up to also. I mean, I am one hot mother now. Every time we tried to give him a hard time, he was so proud about it. <laughs> you know, he really felt like he was America's sexiest man. You know, <laughs> he thought he should have been number one. I don't know how I got in, but I wasn't in the top 50. I was definitely in the top 15. Since Gruden was still under contract with the Raiders, the price for his services was high. The Bucks gave Oakland two first and two second round draft picks. I told Gruden, is there supposed to be like some elephants or, you know, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex or something that comes with you. It's just this little bitty fella right here I get. That's it. Then he looks at you and he gives you that look and he says, I'm 50, one of the 50 most beautiful people. I'm like, hey, now that makes it all better. Thanks. How you doing? It was apparent early on that Gruden was nothing like his predecessor. Everything going all right? Anything we can do to make camp a little bit better experience for you? Whereas Dungy was a pat on the shoulder pads, Gruden was a kick in the pants. Come on, Marquise, get your ass in here! This guy had a full-fledged bite. A venomous bite. I need a Z! God dang it, Daryl! I mean, you just couldn't sit still. And he used to always say, bring juice to the practice field. And if you ain't got any juice, you fake it. <laughs> when we come out here practice in the morning, I really don't care what kind of moods we're in. We're gonna have a lot of juice, and it's genuine. Gruden had a lot of juice for a man who hardly slept. He normally arrived at the office at 3.30 a.m. I'm a morning guy. I feel like I can get a lot more done early. And I got a routine that I've had for about 20 years since I've been at coaching. You go in his office and it's jet black dark. Mind you, I get there at 7 o'clock in the morning. He's been there four hours. Jet black dark. And there's nothing on but that computer screen he's packing. And I just watched the man work, and I really got an appreciation for somebody that really loves the game. Every day, you build. You put blocks down. You guys ever see a big, beautiful mansion? You got to build the foundation, man. That's what we're doing here. Understand that. You got to build the blocks, and you got to put blocks on every day. Gruden knew the key to winning over the team was winning over its most outspoken player, Warren Sapp. I just wanted to make sure Warren was happy. He's like that ogre underneath the bridge, you know. He's going to let you know, don't come across my bridge. I'm going to take your head off. But now I might just go crazy, <laughs> lose my mind. In the first practice, the offensive-minded coach earned Sapp's respect by going on the attack. I said, well, we got defense. Let's see what this guy can do. First play 9 on 7, I, like yesterday. In what is normally a power running drill, Gruden caught the defense off guard by calling a quarterback bootleg. I looked him right in the eye, and I said, if you're scared, say you're scared. And he looked back at me, and he said, well, it looked like they've been running boot on you for the last three years, so now what? 
And that's where the challenge started. <laughs> no, five crazy bastards. You're used to maybe a running back on the team saying, I'm going to run right through you today. And he said, all right, bring it on, you know. But here's the head coach, Lynch. I'm throwing five slants right by your ear. You ain't going to know what hit you. And I go, well, you aren't even playing. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's why you love the man. When I saw him in the hallway, it wasn't. With Tony, it was, hey, how you doing, Warren? With Gruden, it was, you son of a I'm going to get you today. <laughs> this was Gruden's challenge, and he laid it on the defense in no uncertain terms. Being great was not good enough. If you're such a great defense, why don't you score on defense? And I'm talking nine touchdowns. Score nine touchdowns. If you're so good, I keep hearing about all these stats, catch the ball, intercept it, and run it back for a touchdown. If you want to dominate and win a Super Bowl, you got to score nine touchdowns. We got to score. He challenged us. He challenged us. We got to score. Get a little bounce, fellas. <laughs> win on three. One, two, three. At the start of the 2002 season, the defense took charge. After an opening day loss, the Bucks shut out the Ravens to kick off a five-game winning streak. When we got to Baltimore, that was kind of our way to jumpstart our season as a defense because I picked Chester Taylor up that day and bammed him into the ground like a stake. We all kind of laughed about it. it? You know, we just told each other, I said, we just got a flat foot and knock people out, fellas, and we want to get this thing rolling, and off we went. We were after everything that year. We had the players to do it. Linebacker Derek Brooks was everywhere. In a five-week span, he scored four touchdowns. His touchdowns came courtesy of Warren Sapp. The defense had carried Tampa Bay to five and one, but the offense had yet to improve under Gruden and threatened to be the team's Achilles heel. The 2002 Buccaneers started the season 5-1. and one. But over the first few weeks, John Gruden's offense was nearly outscored by his defense. Hey, we don't know what the f*** we're doing. Part of the problem was a steep learning curve with Gruden's West Coast system. Hey, I'm not going to be a real patient guy now. Dance the red right. The X always goes away from the call, man. Round 50. You right. You are the U man. Come on, Jamil. You know what? You're like my wife when you get in space. You just get lost. Hey, listen, on the dummy audibles, don't be a dumbass yourself. When we have a dummy... The offense and its verbiage were especially hard on the quarterback. Even a veteran like Brad Johnson. Hey, Brad, you got trips left. Trips left, 73 Reno. Halfback slow screen right. You get a blitz, go to 59 Turner Delta. It was going to be a challenge. We spent a long time together those first three or four months, and maybe the verbiage uh, was a little difficult at times. If I call pass 94 punch X deep cross, it's a very simple play. There's a concept. It's a deep cross, and then it's a flat. I don't just start handing all over. You know what I mean? Yeah. Are you with me or not? I'm with you the whole way. The early frustration with the offense was obvious. Receiver Keyshawn Johnson lashed out at the head coach on national TV. I hate to break this to everybody out there, but you're only allowed to have five eligible receivers. And if you want two tight ends and two backs, you only have one receiver in a game. We call it you personnel. I want you, Big Ten! And I remember on Monday Night Football, we called you personnel McCardle instead of you personnel Keyshawn. Give me you, McCardle! You, Keenan McCardle, get Keyshawn out of the game. And he didn't like it, and I don't blame him for not liking it. He didn't want to come out of the game. But that stuff happens all the time. Bottom line was we tried every which way we could to get Keyshawn to be a big part of the game plan, and he was. Oh, it's a touchdown, Tampa Bay. And Keyshawn's 
scores his first touchdown. The Bucks traded for Johnson after the 1999 season in an attempt to improve a perennially weak receiving core. That offseason, he did not endear himself to some of the veterans. One in particular never forgave him. In 1999, we go to the championship game, we lose. So now I got my whole coaching staff at the Pro Bowl with me. I mean, the thing's painted with bucks. Keyshawn's a New York Jet. Keyshawn comes to me and says, listen, dog, me and you unite. We can put this thing together. You just need a little offense. I and mean, you know, mind you, I just lost the game 11 to 6. Oh, I get you that seven points, cut. We can do this. So I go to Dungey and I lobby for Keyshawn. I lobby. They signed him to a great deal. We go do all season. We always do all season together. All of us do. We work out, we go eat together, and then we break from there. That's Buck Ball. That's our family. There's no other vacation place. We're in Florida. We're in the Sunshine State. Where else you want to go? I got I got mangroves for you to fish in. I got the the, the Miami three hours away. You want to party? I got Orlando. You want to take the kids to Disney World? Where you want to go? I got everything. It's a great state of Florida. It's my home. I've lobbied for you to be on my team. I need five points to get to a Super Bowl. Hello? Don't you want to go too? He's a no-show. He never was one of us. He just wanted the contract and the notoriety, but he didn't want the work. It's a difference between mandatory and voluntary mandatory. I re you know, I'll, I'll take my chances on the voluntary mandatory stuff. I'm not saying that he couldn't play the game because he was a good player. But was he one of those rare air special guys? No. For all his faults, Johnson caught 76 passes in 2002 and brought a swagger to the offense. Take three. It take three. Shut your ass up. All that screaming. Play football. Man, you a fake ass John Randall. Shut your ass up. Sorry, Brad, I'm gonna get you killed, but sorry about that. He was a big and reliable target for Brad Johnson. And together with free agents Joe Jaravicious and Keenan McCardle, the Bucks finally had enough weapons to beat the Eagles. Or so they thought. That was our nemesis. We thought maybe with Grudes, all right, things are going to change, and there we go, and it's the same old story. That team just wore us out. Brad Johnson was sacked five times and suffered a broken rib. Once again, Tampa Bay was humiliated in Philadelphia. He's going to run. He's in. Touchdown. He score. We'll be back. We'll be back. Be on the bus. Right underneath the vet. I'm looking out this window, and I mean, I just got a burn in my gut right now because I really hate the Philadelphia Eagles at this point because this is the third time in a row they've gotten me. And I just want to just, like, kill somebody right now. I'm on the bus, and I'm riding. There's nothing I can do. And I remember Gruden looking over in the seat at me, and he said, hey, you know what? They'll never get us again. I said, you know what? They better not. And he said, no, no. He said, I got them. He said, I got their blisses. I know what they're doing. I have it down, and we're going to stick a stake right in this place. He said, if we see him again, we'll dissect them. For much of the season, the Buccaneers' offense was stuck in neutral. That all changed in week nine against the Minnesota Vikings. We opened it up a little bit, and Brad was hot. Brad looked good. Brad looked great. And he threw all kinds of passes. And that was the best I'd seen all year. The players were beginning to understand the system and appreciate the man who had implemented it. Goes all the edge. Oh, Years of disappointment, the Bucks finally had an effective quarterback. But they always had Mike Allstott. And in 2002, the A train was rolling. He is an anvil, you know. The Cleveland Brown game was a hot day. It's 115 heat index. So late in the game, if we bring Allstott in and we run 96 power. Honest to God, the, the run lasted five minutes.
He went from right to left to right to left, and it was one anvil smash after another. It was the damnedest run I ever saw. Get that train going. Get that A train going. It's A train time. When he was running the football, no one was sitting on the bench on that sideline. Everybody wanted to get up and see what he was going to do to the next guy. Hand off all time. Running right. Three, two, one. Get the A train the ball. When I used to do my radio show, my favorite call of Gene was All Star of the Gut. All Star of the Gut. All Star of the Gut. <laughs> you just have to have fun with it. Let's go, Mike! Up the gut, yeah! All Stop Up the Gut soon gave way to another saying, Pound the Rock. It was the brainstorm of line coach Rod Marinelli, and it took the form of an 80-pound piece of granite that ended up in the Bucks' locker room. The Rock is the opponent, basically, and you got to visualize yourself holding on to a hammer, and taking the best swings you can at that rock, trying to crack your opponent. If you keep pounding that rock, you keep pounding that rock, eventually it's gonna bust. And at first it's not gonna feel like it's gonna bust, but particularly if you come together and do it as a unit, eventually that thing will bust. And that became my rally cry that year. At nine and three, the Bucks hosted the Falcons and their cornerstone, Mike Vick in a battle for first place in the NFC South. We come in on Wednesday. We pop the tape on. It's just the third down tape. Simeon Rice is beside me, and we're just watching the tape. And I mean, this guy is just... <laughs> Best football I had ever seen before in my life. And Simeon yell, hey man, is this a highlight tape? <laughs> and somebody yells in the front row, hell no, it's the third down real fool. And we're like, are you kidding me? You know, what great players like that, great athletes, sometimes make you do is play passively uh, because you see them making everyone else look foolish. But what you've got to do is just go after them. What is it? Michael Vick never had a chance. Not in the face of the Buccaneers' defensive speed. How fast is that defense? How can he set up? How can he set up? How can he set up? Part of the Buck strategy was to assign Derek Brooks as number seven's personal shadow. Brooks was our defining factor for anybody that we were gonna face. Not only that, we got Brooks. Vic, we got Brooks. To see Brooks stop, start, shuffle, form, fit, tackle a guy like that, that was one hell of a play. These guys were fired up. It was a fun day. Vic ended up with only 15 yards rushing. Tampa's offense put up 34 points, and the Bucks took control of the NFC South. I thought our defense all week, you kept your cool. They talked about the great Michael Vick, he's a great talent. How are you going to stop Michael Vick? How are you going to stop him? Now one word was said about how somebody's going to stop this defense. Remember that. The greatness of this defense is ahead, but we're going to finish strong. his first year in Tampa, John Gruden was obsessed with taking the Buccaneers to the next level. I have no friends. My wife hates me. All I have is you, Ken. But weekends offered the occasional diversion. Football-related, of course. That season, John's brother Jay was working double duty as a Bucks assistant and an Arena League quarterback. Hey, Jay threw five touchdowns last night. They won 49. Yeah, yeah. You know, my brother, he's, you talk about a guy that loves football. He was coaching for us and then playing for the Predators. And I love going to those games. Good luck, man. Thank you, man. Love you, bro. Ready to roll? Hey, don't take them lightly. Get after their ass. All right. And my heart is racing faster during those games than it is during our games. Hey! Hey! Hey, Ralph! Hey, you know what a late hit is? You guys just watch a game like a fan? Are you a fan tonight? 
It was a rough in the passer penalty. Several of those they didn't call. Come on, ref! I just have, have had a history, I guess, of telling referees what I think. Hey, Boris, what the f was that call on Seth? Are you kidding me? That's a face mask, man! That's my brother out there, man, you know, and that's a little bit different when your brother's a quarterback. Gruden's outdoor team needed a win in the season finale in order to earn a first-round playoff spot. The game-time temperature did not bode well for the warm-weather Bucks. And we hadn't won a game in the history of the franchise when temperatures were below 40 degrees. And it's cold out there. We got all the long sleeves on, and we got breath coming out of our helmets for the first time. And guys are like, you know, hey, look at this. You know, I'm saying this is not going to go well. These guys are not handling this very good. The Buccaneers shut out the Bears. Derek Brooks, the league's defensive MVP, recorded his fifth interception. And Tampa finished the season with a franchise best 12 wins. Two weeks later, the Buccaneers celebrated with a playoff route of the San Francisco 49ers. Go to work. Got him, coach. Tampa Bay had come this far before. They hired John Gruden to push them far. Once again, the road to the Super Bowl would go through Philadelphia. All that stood between the Buccaneers and the Super Bowl was the Philadelphia Eagles, a team that had haunted them the past three years. It would be the last game ever played in Veterans Stadium. You know what's next, guys. You know what's next. This is, this is what you've been waiting for, you know. It's an opportunity to maybe score an offensive touchdown in Veterans Stadium before they blow it up. And the friendly city has been on count. The night before the game, Gruden showed the team footage from September of 1995. The Bucks won at the vet, defeating Gruden's former team. He went back, and we were in the orange uniforms, and I had a pick in that game. He showed me making a pick, and we beat him pretty good. I remember I was the offensive coordinator. I was boy wonder at that time, and after that game, I was boy blunder. People were throwing hoagies at me and everything. So we showed them a little NFL history to let them know that, my God, the Buccaneers have won here before. It's time we won there again. What an opportunity to silence these fools. Let's go. We've been waiting this for this. We've been prepared for this for all this year. We're ready. We're going to go out there, and we're going to take our cuts at that rock, okay? That's all I know. And we got a hell of a game plan, man. Trust me. Just trust me. If it doesn't go good early, don't worry about it. Pound the rock. And let's get the hell out of here. 52 seconds into the game, the Eagles took the lead. It doesn't start well. Our offense is struggling. We're kind of slugging back and forth. And you couldn't help but start to say, here we go again. Then the Bucks got a lift from receiver Joe Jaravicious, a third down specialist who nearly missed the game. That week, he was in a, in a hospital room with his wife. You know, and as his child, just been born, and things weren't going well. And uh, we didn't think he was going to play. I did not think he was going to play. We show up that Saturday, I see Joe. I walk up to him, I say, everything good? He said, I don't think so, but I'm good. Sleep-deprived nights of film study paid off for Gruden on the game's longest drive. And Joe Jaravicious was the key. Here comes Joe. I got him. That's what Gruden said, I got him. 359, X logo, deep receipt. We had three receivers stacked tight. Dilger was isolated on the backside, 
And we tried to get Jura Vicious a one-on-one -on -one option route against their inside linebacker, I believe it was Gardner. And in certain coverages, you got a chance to hit the lottery. It's caught Jura Vicious, 35, to the 40, to the 45, to the 50. Oh, the sideline go, 35, 30, Jura Vicious to the 20, 15, 10. He's out of bounds at the five-yard line. You go, Joe, you go, Joe. I'd never seen Jura Vicious run like that. He was flying. I have not seen Joe Jurovicius run that fast ever. I think he had a little bit of his son's spirit with him. And right then, the atmosphere changed on that sideline. Jurovicius's catch set up a one-yard touchdown run by Mike Allstott. It's pounded in the rock time. Allstott running left, throws the shoulder, touchdown Tampa Bay! Mike Allstott takes it to the house! Leading 20 to 10 in the fourth quarter, Tampa had to ward off one last Philly drive. We have McNabb sack. That damn McNabb is unbelievable. He, he reverses his field maybe once or twice and throws a ball, big play. But he makes the third part of the 11 yard line. The game is never over with this guy. Cornerback Rondé Barber, number 20, erased any doubt. 27 the greatest moment I have in my life is seeing number 20 hustling down their sidelines to send us to the Super Bowl. That was, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, joy. The Buccaneers are the champions of the uh -oh. NFC. How about that? We're going to the Super Bowl. They set it down, they set the vet down. No more vet. There's no greater feeling than going into a place and taking it. They had the whole cavalry there. They had horses and police cars. They had everything there to help with their celebration. And none of them got to celebrate. It was eerie. It was awesome. You know how when you win a championship, they tape off the field and roll the stage, the stage out in the middle of the thing and have a good time, right? I forgot we're in Philly. <laughs> So there's no celebration that's gonna happen in the middle of the field, right? I'm bouncing around, I got my hat on. Next thing I know, I realize I am the only Tampa Bay Buccaneer that's anywhere outside. <laughs> Not on the field, outside. I take off running, I get in the locker room, it's a full-fledged party going on. They handed me the George Hallis trophy. Here you go, big fella. I know you want to touch this. I gave it back to him. I said, nah, this is not the one. But we'll take this one back to Tampa and drop him off on our way to go get the other one because we ain't done. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers finally got past the Eagles. But they had trouble getting out of Philadelphia. You know, the union workers at the Philadelphia airport, they made sure that we didn't get out on time. Okay, our luggage, everything wasn't boarded. We had to sit on the runway for three hours. That really still ticked me off. You know, we got a chance to get home, man. Uh, that's no lie either. I know there was a little methodical planning going on there. Conspiracy theories aside, time was short. Super Bowl 37 was only six days away, and the game was across the country in San Diego. I was going home to San Diego, my hometown, which made it even more special. But it was just such a quick turnaround. We go out there, and the coaching staff all stayed in Tampa because they wanted to game plan. So we were out there with no coaches. We stayed behind, and we worked basically all day and all night on Oakland. And I remember putting Simeon Rice in charge of the team. OK, Simeon's going to do bed check. He's going to take care of everything. I knew we were in good hands with Simeon Rice as a chaperone. I think he kind of said that in jest, and we all knew that. <laughs> I don't know if we would have showed up for the game uh, had that been the case. Oh, I have fun. I'll break curfew. <laughs> I'm going to set the tone right. 
That's it. No one missed curfew. There was too much at stake and too many bad feelings for Gruden's former team, the Oakland Raiders. He just wanted to shine his shoes with Callahan and Al Davis. I mean, that's just what it was. He was going to show them that they made the biggest mistake of their life of letting him out the door. That week, Gruden left no stone and no rock unturned. Having coached Rich Gannon in Oakland, Gruden figured that he himself could best mimic the Raiders' offense in practice. At some point during that week, I was going to be Rich Gannon and simulate the Raiders' offense against the greatest defense in football. And uh, that was a film I will never, ever lose. I was great that day. And when I threw that slant to Carl the Truth Williams right in front of Brian Kelly, I mean, the place went crazy. I did make some nice throws. You know what? It's kind of like a fish story. The longer you get away from it or the more it's told, the greater the story. Welcome to San Diego, California. Super Bowl 37. It is Tampa Bay versus the Oakland Raiders. Here we go, nine nine. Somebody that's sketching. Somebody that's sketching. Let's go. Let's go. You gotta love this. Love it. That was unbelievable, you know. I was uh, on a headset, I remember, with my brother. And when Larry Zonka standing right next to me, grabs my arm, says, hey, Gru, good luck. I told my brother, I said, hey, Larry Zonka knows my name. How about that? Was that pretty cool? I said, this is a big game today, Johnny. This is going to be one day I'll never forget. To neutralize the NFL's number one offense, Gruden knew they had to limit the Raiders' most effective play. The big play the Raiders had consistently gotten all year was a sluggo seam where he's going to pump the sluggo. He's going to pump that slant and go and try to get the free safety to go that way. And in so doing, he's going to throw that seam backside. So we must have run 100 sluggo seams, and it paid great dividends. Dexter, don't let him pull you with this pump. We'll get to our landmarks. In the Super Bowl, it played out perfectly. Every subtlety, every seam route, the Bucks were there. The pocket collapsed on Rich Gannon. Ooh! And a baby! We did a great job defending that in the game. I think Lynch called him out a couple times. Hey! Sluggo seam! Sluggo seam! Ready, it's it! Let's let first down Tampa from the 45. Gannon pump fake looking to his right, throwing to his right. Oh, intercepted! Dexter Jackson to the 40! Right before the snap, it's Sluggo C. We ain't even started yet. Let him keep throwing. Let him keep going. Overall, Tampa intercepted Gannon five times and returned three for touchdowns. In a one-sided affair, the Bucks were at their brashest, boastful best. When it's third and six, and Tim Brown runs an out route, and then he drops it. And Dwight Smith looks at him and said, damn, Tim, you waited 15 years to do that? <laughs> and that the fact that Jerry Rice didn't have a catch until the third quarter. And when he gets that catch, when he gets up and says, hey, Jerry, welcome to the Super Bowl. You know, it's little things like that that make the Super Bowl fun. I told you, Swan, you're from your box. Keep your mind on the prize. Let's go. Keep your mind on the prize. In the fourth quarter, Derek Brooks put the exclamation point on Tampa's first ever Super Bowl. such a tight family really and you've been through a lot and your dream is to someday hoist that trophy and right then the realization that, that we were going to uh, it all just hit us hey Derek <laughs> so, so proud of you man 
You're the champion, man. You are the stallion of the world, man. He did it. The league had warned us about security. No family members were going to be allowed to come on the field, but we won with such time. The guys just started. Keyshawn, I believe, was the first who went up and got his kids, and we all just started. Being, and eventually, the security couldn't do anything. Oh, I'm... I can't believe it, Jakey. We did it, buddy. We did it. The Bucks defeated the Raiders 48 to 21 and the defense finished with nine touchdowns on the season. The exact number Gruden said it would take to win a championship back in August. At age 39, Gruden became the youngest head coach to win a Super Bowl. It was only fitting that after the game, they were playing his song. Bon Jovi is my hero. Bon Jovi. I mean, honestly, I listen to Bon Jovi, and you know, I drive my car wherever I can find him to listen to him play. And he, he has a song called "My Life." This just sounds corny, man. But after the game, I look out there on the field, and there's Bon Jovi singing "My Life." So I'm thinking, this is one hell of a day now. It's my. So is my wife, I'm looking out for my wife. She's usually hanging around out. It's my life. It took 27 years, but the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had completed their journey from winless wonders to world champions. How about that, Mr. Glazer? Huh? We did it, Dad. Best in the world, man. <laughs> The way we had done it, going from the yucks, as, as Sap says, turning the third world country into the Taj Mahal, I mean, it just teaches you how difficult it is to attain one of those. No matter what anybody says, you know, I was there for this. Sometimes I kind of wear it around my house when no one's there and I just kind of look at it, you know. It's an awesome game, man. Awesome, awesome game. I'm just happy to say I was part of it. They always say football, you make friends for life. Family, blood. I kill with them boys any day of the week and twice on Sunday.